uh, on this webinar that is talking about disability considerations during the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, this is the English uh, webinar. We had a session this morning for the Spanish-speaking um, parts of the Americas, and this afternoon we're going to run through um, the same presentations. We've got some uh, speakers giving some pr uh, perspectives from their countries and their perspectives. Um, so to start off with, my name is Anthony Dettin. I'm the advisor on disability and rehabilitation um, at the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization. Um, I'm standing in for Alex Camacho, who is in the emergency team this afternoon. He was uh, called away unexpectedly, but um, uh, I'm going to be the moderator of this panel this afternoon. It's uh, uh, extend a big welcome to everybody. For those um, wishing closed captioning on the bottom right hand side of this slide, um, you should be able to uh, click to access closed captioning and we will type that up onto the comments now. Um, we have a live cart transcription available um, for those uh, who wish to follow uh, visually as the uh, presentations are taking place. If you have any issues with that, please reach out. Um, and let us know. So the session today will consist of a numerous different stages. To start off with, we have a presentation on uh, the current situation of COVID-19 in the Americas. Uh, following that, we have a presentation from Jennifer Johnson. Unfortunately, this is an old uh, slide and we'll correct that, but they have a presentation from Jennifer Johnson from the um, Administration of Community Living in the United States to give a perspective on the um, uh, situation happening on inclusion uh, for people with disabilities in the COVID response in the United States. After that, uh, myself and a colleague, German Parodi from Inclusive Disaster Strategies, will be presenting um, about recommendations and considerations for the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Um, I will be presenting a new uh, document that is uh, just been launched by the WHO uh, with key considerations for countries, for actors in countries to consider in this response. Uh, and we will also have some time for questions and answers and discussions and hopefully hear from some people uh, about their perspectives. And closing, we have uh, Anna Lucia from the International Disability Alliance giving us some closing remarks. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Andrea Vicari from the um, Public Health Emergencies team to give us a, a bit of an overview of the current situation of COVID-19 in the Americas. Thank you, Andre. Yes, thank, thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm, I will need to retrieve my presentation because the one that is shown is not the one. Can you see it? Yes, we can see that now. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you so much for the invitation to present uh, the uh, update and uh, an update. Um, what I like to say really off the bat is that, you know, I, I know that uh, this audience may have the great expectation to see data disaggregated by different type of variables, in particular, you know, uh, by age, uh, definitely gender, uh, maybe as well uh, different, uh, different needs that uh, may exist in the population. But I have to say that, unfortunately, uh, there is something that even though this has been uh, an outbreak and a, an epidemic, a pandemic that has been around for three months, that there is still little information where really several different variables, if you want, there are really uh, analyses that are really done along different variables. So it is often time it's just a type of frequencies so of time of data that is really presented all in term of uh, of um, of one variable. 
So uh, just to say that uh, in terms of, uh, can you see my first slide for the spectrum? COVID-19 clinical management. We're not seeing that at the moment. Um, just give us a second. We're just um, updating the technical piece. Okay, I think uh, we can see your slide now. Okay, yes, apologies for the interruption. So essentially, what we know and what we have known since the early early stages of this uh, of this uh, outbreak is essentially, at least from the data of China, that really these is a quite severe uh, disease. So generally, in terms of the cases that have been seen in, in, in China, 80% 80 of the cases are what we call uh, moderate or mild. Does that means they are non-pneumonia non or mild pneumonia cases, part of which uh, don't need hospitalization, but part of which definitely as well need some sort of hospitalization. But what is really a kind of uh, uh, worrying is the part that is really that 20% of patients that are either severe, 14%, 15%, and 5% that are, uh, who are critical. Uh, a severe case is essentially a case where there is already some, uh, really some uh, difficulty in terms of uh, respiratory difficulties, either you know, manifested as a dyspnea, as a shortness of breath, the difficulty respiratory, and these really are cases that definitely need uh, some sort of hospitalization, and many times as well, a specific uh, uh, respiratory therapy as well in terms of, for instance, uh, for instance oxygen, uh, access to oxygenation. There is definitely as well a part of 5%. These are really critical patients that need uh, intensive care units, uh, access to intensive care uh, bed, if you want. And these are really patients that have a respiratory failure, septic shock, and all, uh, multiple organ dysfunction and failure. Uh, from the data out of China, Essentially, 50% of uh, these patients uh, are actually uh, ever fatal outcome. In a sense, uh, they will pass away. Eventually, the impact of this uh, uh, pandemic will really result from two essentially two variables. One is the transmissibility of what we are seeing in terms of this novel coronavirus, and the other one is the severity. I already saw to you that this is a quite severe uh, disease. Uh, there can be definitely uh, quite of severity. But we didn't really know a little bit it was about the transmissibility, especially whether they, what we saw in China was something that was uh, on, we will not see the same uh, as well elsewhere or not. And unfortunately, uh, the case of Italy and more recently what we are seeing as well in North America and part of South America, unfortunately it seems that there can be places, there can be a uh, country where we can see as much of a transmission of things uh, as we have seen early on in China. And the next slide is essentially comparing uh, the two maps at two different moments Two months apart, as you can see, in uh, in, in, in January 25th, um, there were uh, 1,300 confirmed cases, 41 reported deaths, and they were mainly really in China, especially within China as well, within the city of Wuhan, and then in the province of Hubei. But at that point, really, if you see what those two months uh, of difference can make. Essentially, that we are not up to yesterday, 
in terms of uh, over 400,000 confirmed cases, almost in all of the countries of the world, very few countries have not ever have been, have reported any case. And as well, you can see uh, our 1,800, 400, uh, 18,400 reported there. So this has really become, if you want, as declared as well, uh, five, uh, a week ago, 10 days ago, uh, a pandemic. Then this uh, slide is showing the epidemic curve of COVID-19 cases. An epidemic curve is essentially just the cases that are reported every day for the, the six different uh, regions of WHO. What you can see here is essentially that initially the cases were dominated by China, the cases in China, up to maybe a month ago, 24th of uh, February. And then gradually you can start seeing as well cases, or at least an expansion of cases, as well in other regions uh, in other regions. Particularly, obviously, first in New York, with the case of Italy, and then Spain, more recently as well, France and the UK, perhaps. And you can see them more recently as well, in the last couple of weeks as well, in the Americas, essentially, first of all, uh, in, the, in the US, at least in some of the shortest cases, but then as well, uh, more gradually as well, we are seeing these cases uh, somewhere else. So as of yesterday, 85% uh, of the cases, reported cases, and 84% of the reported that in our region of the America were actually in the United States, of which 50% and 35% respectively were in New York State. However, we are seeing as well cases now in the other countries that I've seen, uh, Brazil over 2,000 cases, uh, Canada 2,500 cases, Ecuador 1,200, and Chile as well, 1,100. Overall, as of yesterday, 11 counties have reported 300 or more uh, cases to Montevideo. And as well, essentially, for eight counties in the region of the America reported community transmission as of yesterday. Next, uh, maybe I want, I like to go into uh, what is really uh, the, a couple of examples, because uh, we always talk about country, but really within a country, you can really have different type of situation. And at the end, every pandemic or every epidemic is really a composition of outbreaks at the subnational level. And so this is the case of uh, Lombardy in Italy. As you may know, it's a region of Italy in the, in the north of Italy, roughly 10 million people. It's an high income uh, region of Europe. Uh, and uh, before uh, the, 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 this uh, epidemic was there, there was reported uh, roughly 660 intensive care bed unit uh, beds reported in, in, in London. As you can see, uh, over basically a month of period, uh, there has been uh, over uh, 82,000 82, people who were tested, 32,000 were confirmed. And you can see as well that from recovered, uh, there are roughly 7,300 people, and unfortunately, 4,500 people actually died. But you can as well see that for this period of time, there is still really uh, quite, uh, it's not only a um, uh, disease that can cause hospitalization and even require intensive care, but it, the length of stay as well that you need to provide care as well can be rather long. And so uh, the last data is 11% of the cases that are hospitalized actually need intensive care. As you can compare to the data I showed before, 5% for China, it seems actually a little bit higher in here, it's even the double, in terms of lethality up to 14%, uh, even though that this case fatality, it's always, we may always need to be careful to uh, evaluate this type of data while an outbreak is occurring, because you can have some sort of biases in both the denominator and as well the numerators of these uh, range. The next slide is showing you uh, an important consideration as well, uh, which is essentially uh, the uh, what could be uh, the the under the, the, the that the risk at least of dying really is uh, related to uh, pre-existing conditions. As you see here in the data from China, 10% uh, of uh, people with uh, cardiovascular disease uh, and, uh, and, uh, will, uh, will die. 
uh, the other factor of, uh, of, uh, of risk in terms of uh, risk of death, you can see hypertension and diabetes. In terms of the data uh, from Italy, actually all that would be uh, cardiovascular diseases are actually higher, 25 percent is the lethality for, uh, for at least uh, it's, 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 more, it's more frequent as uh, one of the reasons uh, for dying. Uh, another part that maybe is not shown in these slides is actually that in Italy, uh, the risk of uh, dying by gender is actually a little bit dis different, up to maybe 70 years of age is not very much different between uh, men and women, but between 70 and 90, per and 90 years of age, uh, actually it's, it's, uh, the risk for men is actually two to three times, uh, two to three times uh, greater. Next, uh, what I'd like to show you is actually the example of, uh, of uh, New York. Uh, as you know, it's a little bit of uh, the epicenter of uh, the outbreak right now in the US, in North America, and generally I think as well uh, globally, if you want, if you look at the data that are coming out from uh, New York. As you can see in this uh, slide, essentially it is uh, as well, uh, is actually uh, the uh, rate of uh, uh, emergency care visits, uh, emergency department visits, if you want it in terms of what, what is an influenza-like illness or as well in pneumonia. And as you can see, it's essentially that after the period that traditionally is a period of flu, which is, uh, is up to maybe early, uh, early um, March, uh, really in the last few weeks, there is really this increase in terms of visits by the older age group, uh, but it's not only uh, the elderly, but it's as well, definitely as well the adults of age 18 to 45 and uh, 45 to 65 as well. Uh, there is a slide that I'm not showing you, but essentially that as well is, there is, is a similar slide for admissions that mean hospitalization, and that uh, is clearly even more uh, clearly, uh, it's even more clear there is for uh, the elder and the older age. The next one uh, is uh, just uh, for this, uh, for this uh, distribution as well in terms of age and as well in terms of sex for all the cases in New York City. As you can see, uh, it's, uh, it has always been a little bit uh, difficult uh, when people communicate about the risk of this disease. They always stress a little bit too much the idea that this is only a risk for uh, elderly, but actually the data actually showing as well that uh, maybe there is a lesser risk uh, for younger uh, ages, but there is still a risk as well for both for, uh, for, being, um, for being a case, if you want, of uh, developing a clinical disease, but as well definitely as well for a severe disease. And you can see as well in terms of New York, in terms of the confirmed cases, 55%, uh, 45 percent of the cases are actually the minority, so one relative minority were well over 50. And uh, again, the, the male uh, are somewhat uh, in majority with 57%. So to conclude, I just wanted to show you a little bit what we see uh, from our uh, perspective, what are the main uh, issues or main uh, needs in terms of the response uh, to that somewhat high level type of uh, indication uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean. If you want, there is a major pillar, which is uh, saving lives, which is the need of saving lives. Uh, this is, of course, always an important consideration in an emergency. Uh, it means that, you know, we need to re reorganize health services and plan for search, maintain infection prevention and control in all health services, providing an optimized clinical management along a continuum of care, and definitely as well in terms of the optics the topic of today as well in, in the need of different needs uh, for different people and assure as well the supply chain. On the other end is this idea of slowing spread, which is essentially a lot of the type of uh, social distancing and travel related measures that we are looking, but in many of our countries we are now uh, living in first hand. Uh, but there is as well the need to come, you engage actively the community in terms of uh, of communicating and understanding as well uh, what type of measures can be implemented and you know how can as well be followed. 
But there is a particular part that is uh, obviously becoming very important, is this idea of uh, uh, early detection and isolation of all the cases of tracing and putting on the quarantine of the contacts. At the end, probably really what will uh, lead to control uh, in the medium term uh, this uh, pandemic is really the capacity of finding the cases early, uh, the strict isolation of these cases, and as well uh, tracing and quarantining of the country. I know that these are not actions that are easy to implement everywhere, and uh, maybe they are as well difficult to be accepted by the people being involved, but it's really probably uh, the need of what we need in terms of uh, really being able to control this uh, pandemic on the medium and long. Uh, and that essentially uh, was my contribution this afternoon. Thank you again, and apologies for the technical difficulty. Over. Thank you very much, Andrea, for the very, very interesting and uh, useful insights and perspective into the current situation um, and spread of the coronavirus and uh, implications for the Americas. I'm going to move swiftly on uh, in the webinar now to Jennifer Johnson, who joins us from the Administration uh, of uh, Community Living. Uh, uh, at the, um, she is the Deputy Commissioner on uh, Administration on Disabilities and the Director of the Office of Disability Service Innovations at ACL in the United States and has kindly agreed to give some perspectives from the United States of things that the US is doing to ensure people with disabilities are included in the COVID response. Thank you, Jennifer. John, can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. Okay, great. Uh, well, first, I just wanna thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, as was mentioned, I am the Deputy Commissioner at the Administration on, Div on Disabilities, which is in the Administration for Community Living in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And today I'm gonna to be speaking um, from the perspective of the Administration for Community Living. Uh, our agency uh, works toward advancing opportunities for older adults and people with disabilities to live in the community. Uh, and we fund a variety of programs that really work towards that outcome for people uh, with disabilities and older adults. There are many entities with, at the federal level in the U.S. Uh, that do contribute in various ways to services and supports for people with disabilities. So we are just a part of that. And again, our focus is on funding programs that work towards uh, independence and inclusion and integration of people with disabilities and older adults in the community. Um, for uh, our uh, work right now, you're probably aware that in the U.S., um, a lot of the attention has been focused on uh, developing a rapid response system to the growing outbreak of COVID-19 in the U.S., um, and there's been a lot of activity uh, in uh, Congress and on Capitol Hill to get a, a relief packages funded that is getting, um, uh, is it aimed at economic relief as well as getting uh, funding to states to address the outbreak. Uh, so we've been involved with that activity um, and some of our programs are the target of some of that funding to be able to get things like meals out to people who might be uh, living at home and unable to get out because uh, they've been told to um, isolate themselves socially. So some of those things we are uh, deeply involved in right now. In terms of our priorities for the disability population, uh, one of the things that we are closely monitoring and focusing on is equal access to testing, care, and treatment for disabilities. Um, there's a great concern in the U.S. Uh, and probably elsewhere in the world that people with disabilities uh, are at greater risk, uh, not only for contracting the virus, um, but also um, at greater risk for not getting treatment and care uh, because of assumptions made about their life and their quality of life and whether they might respond to treatment or not. Uh, so that, again, has been something that's been, been very much at the forefront of concerns for our agency and for the disability population within the U.S. Uh, and so we have been working on multiple fronts to make sure that hospitals are aware uh, that they cannot discriminate against uh, people with disabilities if they are seeking uh, testing, care, or treatment. Um, and that they, even if a medical provider thinks that uh, a person with disabilities shouldn't be prioritized because they make certain assumptions about their quality of life, 
uh, that again, they can't make those decisions and that it's discriminatory practice. So some of the things that we're working on is uh, working with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights to make sure that we're getting information out to hospitals and medical providers about uh, uh, ensuring that they are not uh, engaging in discriminatory practices, but also getting resources out uh, to medical providers and also to individuals with disabilities so that they're aware of their rights uh, and also to providers and family members. So again, that's one area of concentration for us. Um, another thing that we're working on is making sure that people have um, information that is accessible to them. Um, in some of the early response efforts, um, we would see that uh, American Sign Language is not being offered when uh, maybe a governor or the president was speaking on TV. Uh, so just making sure that things like ASL, American Sign Language are being offered uh, when there are press conferences or those kinds of things, making sure that any materials that the government develops is written in plain language so that people with varying levels of literacy can understand uh, the information. And so we have been working on getting some resources put together uh, that um, are accessible uh, for people who are functioning at various literacy levels and um, understanding of uh, information that they might read. Another thing that we are working closely on is just individual and family, family preparedness and support. Uh, again, this kind of ties into the first two points about making sure that they're aware of the potential for discrimination in care and treatment, and also making sure that they're getting information that is accessible to them. Um, we want to make sure that uh, when people are being told to socially isolate themselves, but some people with uh, disabilities do rely on direct support providers or personal care attendants to come into their home and care for them, it is a little bit of an inconsistent message to say socially isolate, but you know, if you rely on somebody to help you in your activities of daily living, then what do you do in those situations? Um, and also, how do you prepare if your provider does get sick and can't come to your house to help you um, with activities of day daily living? So we've been trying to get resources put together and out to individuals so that they can start preparing um, for the situation um, if their provider does get sick and come, can't come to the, their house, but also how to practice uh, hygiene and, and taking necessary precautions if you do have somebody who comes in and does have to work closely to you and it's very difficult to practice that social isolation. Um, another thing that we are monitoring very closely is, excuse me, um, making sure that there is continuity of care um, and if that care is disrupted, that we are able to reconnect people to services. Um, there is great concern uh, in the U.S. that with the number of people living in the community that they're going to experience disruption in services. We are seeing some of that already. Uh, for example, in the U.S., uh, there are a number of people who participate in what are called day programs. Uh, and we're seeing those day programs close. And that means that individuals with disabilities will be experiencing a disruption to their routine. Um, and that can create issues uh, for the individual, and especially if they're used to having that routine of, as part of their life. So how do we make sure that those uh, individuals are still being supported? And like I said, if uh, somebody has a direct so support provider that comes into their house and all of a sudden they're not able to come into their house, uh, how do we make sure that they're still getting access to services? Um, some of that could be mean that uh, an individual might have to go into a facility for a short period of time to get care, but then there are facilities that won't be accepting new people because of the virus. So we want to make sure that, again, people are getting access and connected to services under the circumstances. And if they are put in a facility or institutionalized in any way, that they're able to reconnect to services once the outbreak is over. We're also seeing situations where uh, people, uh, there's a spread of the virus in uh, living uh, situations for individuals, especially those living in group homes. Um, and so they, we, we see that if they go into the hospital for treatment, that they might not be able to go home um, because uh, they're, the spread of the virus and them not being able to have a place to go. So they're just stuck in the hospital for the time being. Um, so we are, like I said, closely monitoring where people are and whether they're getting disconnected from their services and how do we make sure that they're reconnected to those services. 
And then finally, uh, for us, we do fund a number of programs across the U.S. and its territories uh, in a variety of areas to support people to live in the community. Uh, some of those programs provide independent living services. Others do research and training. We have a legal advocacy program as well. And so we are working to ensure that those programs have the support that they need uh, because they serve as a great resource um, to states and territories, especially during times of disasters, uh, such as the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, because we find that response teams typically do not have expertise uh, when it comes to people with disabilities. And so again, our programs do provide not only a community resource, but a resource to the states to make sure that response teams are including people with disabilities in any of their efforts. So again, we're making sure that they have the resources they need and connecting to them uh, uh, to make sure that um, we're aware of what their needs are um, and the issues that are going on and we can address those and support them in the, in the response effort. So that is an overview of the work that we are doing and some of the areas that we are prioritizing in the response effort here in the U.S. Wonderful, Jennifer. Thanks ever so much for that really comprehensive overview. And please, if you can, stick around. I think there may be some questions yeah. that people may um, want to ask. On that note, um, people will notice on their bar there is a Q&A panel on the right-hand side. Please type any questions that you may have at the end for Andrea, Jennifer, um, myself, or Herman, uh, as we present now. And we'll try and get to as many questions and answers as we can. We want to give plenty of opportunity for discussion. But thank you for those perspectives and great to hear what is happening. I'm sure that gives a lot of food for thought for other people within the region about activities that they can do. Okay, I'm gonna move now on to my presentation. Um, if we can, can everybody see the presentation there? Okay, so, uh, the aim of the presentation for the next 10 to 15 minutes is really to um, share with you a new document that the World Health Organization has uh, published in the past few days around disability considerations during this outbreak. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to find the will share the link with you at the end um, and hopefully we'll find this information useful, practical uh, and informative for you. Just to talk very briefly about disability across the Americas, uh, the region from North, Central, South America and across to the uh, countries and territories of the Caribbean, uh, 12 to 15 percent of the population are estimated to have a form of disability. 15 percent of the population um, was estimated in the World Report on Disability and other specific studies have, have looked at that, but that's incredibly variable across the, the countries of the region as well. 33 countries in the region of the 35 have ratified the UN Convention on Rights of Disabilities, and that's significant for reasons I'll share in a, in a second. And the UK, Netherlands, and France, who um, have territories uh, in uh, the Caribbean, have also ratified that, so um, territories uh, of, those, of those countries. And of course, other countries have very established and well-functioning legislation and regulations on um, uh, uh, rights and protection uh, and inclusion of people with disabilities, including, of course, as Jennifer was alluding to, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the frameworks um, and emergencies uh, in train in, in wrapped in with um, programs of FEMA uh, and, and other such uh, initiatives. Two articles that I think are particularly pertinent to this current situation from the UN Convention. First of all, the Article 11 around situations of risk and humanitarian emergencies, which clearly states that all necessary measures to ensure the protection and safety of persons with disabilities in situations of risk should be adhered to. And secondly, Article 25 around health, which states that the people with disabilities have the same right to enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination. I think those are two uh, incredibly important um, uh, components to factor in as we develop uh, the response to COVID. So since January, there's been emerging concern over the needs of people with disability in the response. There were certain case stories um, and, and news articles that came out uh, from China where the, the um, 
virus first emerged and across uh, different parts of Asia about people with disabilities experiencing uh, exclusion um, and more challenges in accessing equitable health services. Um, and those then led to a series of recommendations and statements from organizations, agencies, uh, groups of people with disabilities. And last week, the International Disability Alliance and RIADIS, the Latin America network of people with disabilities, gave a statement um, and, and a list of 10 recommendations uh, for the inclusion of people with disabilities in the global COVID response. At the end of last week and launched on Monday, um, the World Health Organization uh, collaborated um, on a uh, document to uh, focus on disability considerations and that as I said was launched just on Monday uh, the first version of this um, I think this will be an evolving uh, and developing document as uh, more evidence and more situations emerge so I think things uh, have uh, an opportunity to be adjusted and changed but this is the first document which has now gone live and we will share the link with you at the end of this and this has just yesterday um, and today gone live um, being translated to Spanish and Portuguese for the region with a French version on the way now and all of those documents are now live on the PAHO website and on the WHO website. The document has two considerations, and I think Jennifer alluded to this earlier on, of uh, why we need to consider people with disability specifically within this response. And the first is that people with disabilities may be at greater risk of contracting the COVID-19 virus because of those barriers to accessing the same public health information as people without disabilities the inaccessibility of um, uh, the unavailability of sign language interpreters, the um, different uh, uh, formats of public health information, perhaps not being accessible to all people with all different types of um, impairment and disability. We also recognize that there may be specific barriers for individuals to actually implementing uh, the hygiene, the recommended hygiene measures such as physical barriers with being able to use the, the hand washing technique that has been um, described and explained, or um, barriers to access such as sink height um, uh, and, and opportunities to operate faucets and handles and so on in public spaces. So recognizing that actually the, the ha hand hygiene and basic hygiene measures that are being recommended may not uh, be as um, applicable uh, or, or easy to apply for all people with disability. Recognizing as well that there may be more challenges in enacting social distancing Jennifer talked a little bit about um, people who have caregivers. Um, there are also potentially times when uh, there's just some more practical difficulties in enacting that social distancing uh, um, for certain groups of people with disability um, who, who may have difficulty in, in uh, following that, that uh, rule and programming. And last, um, needing to uh, touch things to obtain information from the environment or for physical support, support people with low vision or, or, or blindness or, or people who require aids or other physical support may have difficulty in avoiding touching certain things. So we recognize there may be certain factors that, uh, that create greater risk. Secondly, that if those risks are higher, then people who do contract COVID for certain people with disabilities with underlying health conditions uh, those may be exacerbated, which could lead to the development of more severe cases, particularly if there is an underlying element of a respiratory function, an immune, immune system function, or heart disease or diabetes. And um, Andrea, early in his presentation, uh, presented a little bit about that. And there are also uh, significant and long-standing barriers to accessing health care, health care inequity to people without disability. Uh, many historical studies have shown that there are many health inequities um, from physical accessibility of spaces to informational to um, discrimination uh, and uh, attitudes and practices of healthcare providers that lead to difficulties in accessing health care. However, we feel that those impacts can be mitigated if simple actions and protective measures are taken by the key stakeholders. This is a really simple message and the key stakeholders that are targeted in this document. 
of five. We talked to people with disability themselves and their households on ways that they could consider mitigating and reducing their risk. Secondly, to governments. Thirdly, to healthcare workers directly. Fourth, to service providers of uh, disability services. And fifth, to the community. And I'm just going to take a few moments to give some key headline actions. The document contains more concrete considerations um, and illustrative examples. I'll go to the more higher level um, areas um, uh, within those five actors uh, target groups. So firstly, people with disability and the household. So trying to, as much as is uh, possible, reduce the potential exposure. Um, there are general guidances and WHO guidances on the basic protective measures which all people should be taking, people with and without disabilities, and really strongly recommending to follow those guidances um, and reduce those, um, the potential exposure. Also trying to plan to avoid crowded environments, uh, using, if at all possible, uh, services like online services or using um, family members to support or, or community members to support where possible in, um, in purchasing and procuring items. And uh, a specific mention also about people who use assistive products and devices, wheelchairs, uh, walking aids, other devices, uh, to make sure that they are also being disinfected and cleaned down regularly. Um, and not just um, uh, hands, uh, a person's hands, but also making sure devices are, are disinfected regularly. The second component is putting a plan in place to ensure continuation of the care and support you need. So again, considering um, if there are certain aspects or components of day-to-day um, life and that continuation of care and support, being able to have plans and backups or regularly document or clearly documented activities in, in order to um, find contingency measures that agencies might be employing um, or other activities. So whilst we have messages for those agencies as well, also try to be proactive in putting into place those pieces as well. Thirdly, preparing the household should there be um, uh, an instance that uh, COVID-19 so prepare for that eventuality, have uh, contingency plans in place for self-isolation uh, and capacity to be able to self-care or have a plan for caring and, and making sure people in your household knows what to do should it be contract, should you contract, should, should a person with disability in the household contract COVID. And lastly, and very, very importantly, is making um, sure mental health and well-being uh, as well as general physical health are maintained there has been guidance on um, uh, mental health and trying to reduce and minimize stress in this highly stressful time for all people people who may be at high risk may be feeling uh, higher levels of stress the who and paho have been developing lots of um, guidance on mental health and well-being and also physical health and well-being in the webinar spanish this morning a number of um, questions were raised about continuing services like rehabilitation and whether that should uh, continue or, or not. And um, the, the, there's no specific guidance on that at the moment, but really having a uh, clear discussion with your service provider to talk about the um, uh, ways in which you might be able to continue to promote uh, physical health um, during uh, this period. The next specific target group is government, and we really start with um, making sure public health information communication is accessible to people in accessible formats. And we talk specifically around the formats of sign language and closed captioning for any documents that have been brought. But we also want to talk about people with um, and want to highlight the accessible formats for other groups of people with disability, particularly uh, easy read uh, and simple to follow formats for people with intellectual disability, written formats um, in large print braille, uh, and formats for people who are deaf blind as well, um, and using captionings for images within documents or on social media. So making sure that those standards, the universal accessibility standards are adhered to in this important time. Secondly, uh, undertaking targeted measures for people with disability, which includes mechanisms such as financial compensation and support for families and caregivers, 
adopt adaptation of um, flexible work from home policies um, and um, provision potentially of, of hotlines and support lines in accessible um, formats for people to be able to contact, uh, to ask questions, raise concerns. And thirdly, undertake targeted measures for disability service providers, which could include residential accommodation, caregiver services, specialized employment opportunities, or specialized therapies. And considering um, agencies to provide uh, caregivers of uh, people with disabilities, continuity plans, um, consider um, financial support for disability services, working with service providers to reduce the bureaucratic recruitment barriers, um, so, but maintaining the, the standards and protection measures, um, and as mentioned before, hotline for uh, services, for disability services to be able to raise concerns directly. The document has a number of more specific actions, and as, as I alluded to, um, will be elaborated, uh, I'm sure, as we move through this, but um, uh, it will be shared with you uh, after this presentation. The next group is healthcare workers, and in uh, healthcare workers, there are two specific activities. The first is a large one, making sure that uh, healthcare is accessible, affordable, and inclusive for people with disabilities, um, making sure that testing services are completely accessible um, and address any physical barriers, attitudinal uh, and discriminatory and financial barriers to testing, as well as then any uh, treatment and care that might be uh, required. Looking at innovative ways of delivering healthcare services as well, home-based consultations um, where it is um, within the regulations, and also telehealth, and the second part is looking at exploring whether telehealth possibilities um, can be expanded uh, and broadened for people with disability if this is a, a possibility. So again, a number of recommendations for healthcare providers. Specific to disability service providers, four lines of action and recommendations, implementing service continuity plans, considering potentially that a proportion of the workforce may at any time be needing to go into self-isolation, uh, putting plans in place early to be able to ensure that there is continuity of plans uh, to ensure that those services do not get interrupted, uh, communicate frequently, more frequently with people with disability to ensure uh, that their needs um, and support mechanisms are in place and being addressed reducing the potential exposure um, during the provision of disability services. Um, so uh, making sure uh, care, care providers, uh, making sure that uh, disability service providers have full information on prevention, uh, rapid access to testing if need be to ensure that there is no increased risk of transmission from the service providers. And also considering uh, support for people with complex needs um, and making sure that there is uh, contingencies in place uh, for people with complex needs. And recognizing as well that in this uh, context and situation, um, there may be a potential for increased uh, gender-based violence, abuse, and neglect against people with disability, and looking at having safeguarding mechanisms and protection mechanisms in place um, for that. And finally, general actions for the community, which include protection measures adopted by the general public, so reinforcing the, the, the general public measures, considering work arrangements and infection control, revers, uh, infection control measures are supported by employees, uh, implementing flexible working arrangements to allow people with disability to telework if possible, um, and, and allowing uh, leave, including paid leave, if that is uh, potentially not possible, um, and ensuring that there is plenty of uh, protection measures, such as hand sanitizers, in workplace to avoid infection control. Increase access to stores uh, for vulnerable and uh, populations, including people with disabilities. We've seen this in a number of countries, uh, and initiatives of stores providing specific hours to ensure um, certain populations, older persons, persons with disabilities and other groups are able to access um, uh, in, a, in a more quiet and safe environment. And finally, um, encourage support and check-in and community support networks 
uh, to identify and ensure people with disability in the community are being supported and having any specific needs uh, that they have met. Circling back to the health community, I thought it would be useful just to finish as PAHO really engages a lot with the health community, a few real take home and practical messages. Firstly, strongly encourage any healthcare providers and health community to coordinate your actions with disabled people's organizations and disability leaders. People with disabilities um, uh, know the community, they know um, how to engage and the measures that need to be put in place to ensure inclusive measures. So work alongside and with disabled people's organizations to ensure people with disabilities needs are being met. Plan now, prepare, start to engage, sign language interpreters, closed captioning providers, other accessibility experts to ensure your message is, inclusion, is inclusive. Ensure facilities are accessible, staff are trained and will not discriminate. Ensure testing for people with disability, household and caregivers is, um, is available and accessible. And an important point where possible, collecting data disaggregated by disability so that within surveillance, we can track whether people with disabilities are being included in measures such as testing and treatment. There is a lot more as information within the document, as I said, and they'll be shared afterwards, um, but very uh, interested to get feedback. And these are now a uh, live document for you to be able to utilize and consider in your programming. Thank you very much. And over to German uh, for some additional messages from, uh, from uh, the disability community. This is German. Can you hear me well, Anthony? Yes, we're hearing you very well, Jamal. Thank you, Anthony, and, and, and thank you to Paho and, and all the colleagues for the great work you're doing. Uh, my name is Herman Perotti. I am the co-executive director of the Partnership for Inclusive Disaster Strategies. And currently, uh, I hold uh, a position for focal point for the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction for Persons with Disabilities in the Americas. As far as the work the partnership does, uh, we are the only United States-based Persons with Disabilities Organizations uh, nonprofit with the mission of equal access to emergency and disaster programs and services before, during, and after disasters for all people with disabilities, regardless of age and people with access and functional needs. We are the nation's experts on disability rights and accessibility and inclusion through all, out, all phases of disaster operations and emergencies. The partnership was founded to focus on disability inclusive emergency management, community organizing, policy advocacy and training. And through our Port Light Division, we, our member and our partners, navigate complex systems and eliminate barriers to equal access and lead emergency and disasters programs change during disasters for persons with disabilities. In the United States, there's an estimate of roughly 50 million people with disabilities, and in South America, including the Caribbean, another roughly estimate of 50 million people with disabilities. Right now, COVID-19, as far as the CDC reports, is throughout all 50 states, including um, the District of Columbia and the, ter the territories of Puerto Rico and Guam. Additionally, 27 states report community spread. Could you switch to the next slide, please? Oh, are you able to present my slide? Yeah, I think you're on the second slide that starts um, the partnership calls I on emergency. I don't see it, but thank you for switching it. The partnership, thank you, Anthony. The partnership alongside uh, our close partners, the United States National Council for Independent Living, the World Institute for Disabilities, and over 170 United States-based nonprofit organizations that provide or include people with disabilities in their primary services, call, made a national call to action, um, calling out six main points that I'll quickly go over as we have elaborated on them. Primarily, continuity of services for all people with disabilities. Secondly, access to 
accessible information for all people with disabilities, including vision, hearing, intellectual and developmental disabilities, with an understanding of the need for easy read and other access needs for people with autism, cognitive learning, reading, and information process disabilities. On the third point, you'll see the need to ensure that people continue receiving access to their daily needs, including food, housing, health care, continuity of support, often provided by personal care providers, community agencies, and families, I may add. You switch to the next. Thank you. Our last few points go over covering the operationalization of living arrangements through quarantines. And I may add that in communities, not only in the United States, but across the Caribbean, we must be learning from, as it's been mentioned, China, Italy, Spain, but throughout the rest of our countries in the Americas that are not seeing as quick of a rise as in the in the North American countries of the United States and Canada, it is paramount that our South American countries and our countries in the Caribbean take heed and implement needed quarantine so the spread can be flattened quickly. And it is the only way that your businesses can go back into operations. And in putting into place in initial mitigation of including, as Anthony put well, people with disabilities throughout the establishment of your contingency plans will make your country stronger on the other side of this. The fifth point goes over equal access to diagnostic and tests. And as I may add, in other countries, but including the United States, already we have seen a rationing of health access to health care, not only to people that are potentially ill with COVID, but access to health care that people would have needed to go to regardless of COVID-19 and because of issues with COVID-19 are being denied health care. Situations like this are happening coming out of the Western states in the United States of Washington and California. Lastly, the provision of training for agencies and their employment in the in United States legal obligations of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act regarding people with disabilities and throughout the Sadly, yet the United States is not ratified to the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but as most of our countries in our region is not only calling out the Article 11, um, making sure that you include people with disabilities in your emergency management and provisions, and in Article 25 with access to health care, but also Article 5 with non-discrimination throughout all services and provisions, and Article 10, um, ensuring the right to life. Move on to the last slide, please. As people with disabilities, nothing about us without us is the only way that we've learned that we can survive in blue skies. Right now, we have a pandemic and there will be, and there are, concurrent disasters. The United States last year was amongst, if not number one, for pandemic preparedness. And yet, our slow response, it's seeing over 40,000 cases in n nearly two months when the spread really began in the United States, and over 400 deaths. The only way that we will be ready for, in our region for when the summer comes, 
the hurricane season starts, the fire starts all over, please take heed, implement contingency plans now, talk to your PAHO local entities, include people with disabilities, DPOs, civic society, if not, marginalized communities will die and it will be in the government's hands. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Uh, some, some very clear um, and uh, strong points there. So um, very useful and I think very complementary to the um, to the recommendations that both Jennifer presented as well, or the, the work that, that Jennifer presented is being done by ACL, as well as some of those considerations. So I think uh, really that strong mes message of nothing about us without us rings true. We need to make sure that people with disabilities uh, are fully engaged and involved in this response. I'd like to now give some time for questions and answers. Again, there is a box in the right-hand side that people can write uh, questions that they would like to have answered, so please feel free to do so. Meanwhile, we're also putting up um, the QR code and the website where you can get the document that I presented, the WHO document. Um, you can go straight onto the PAHO website and download that directly um, for you to be able to have a look in more detail at that document. So there's three questions that have come up, um, and I'm going to give Jennifer, Herman, and um, myself uh, opportunity to potentially sort of uh, talk about the, the three of them. The first is, um, is social isolation already impacted, impacting or expected to impact mental health of individuals with disabilities? And what are the recommendations and expectations regarding mental health and also suicide rates? Um, I have a few thoughts. Jennifer, I don't know whether you have any perspectives on that before I, I maybe respond. Experience social isolation at a higher rate um, already, and this has the potential to uh, increase that even more. Um, some of the things that we're looking at is um, the use of uh, social media platforms or video uh, conferencing or calling type of platforms and setting those up uh, for people with disabilities so that they can remain connected to people during the um, COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, another thing that we are working on is um, making sure that, again, people are connected to resources. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have received some additional federal funding for our meals program. Uh, and so that is a way that we can make sure people are still connected um, to the community, even though, you know, you might not be able to um, eat, um, eat a meal in person with somebody, you can at least have that delivered and know that there's somebody out there who's willing to help um, in this uh, time. Uh, so we, are also concerned about, uh, I mentioned this a little bit, just um, how um, the, the disruption in people's uh, routines will have an impact on them mentally um, and how, how are we going to respond to that. So one of the things that we're looking at is reaching out to um, local uh, um, emergency departments and um, police departments because oftentimes they are the ones that are called when somebody goes into a behavioral crisis and we could see that increasing um, as routines are disrupted. So, you know, generally we are concerned about uh, the mental health effects that this will have on people with disabilities and looking at ways in which we can address that. Great, thanks Jennifer, that's really useful to hear. Um, from our side, and then Herman, I, I'll, I'll allow you to also give um, some perspectives on this. Um, we've been working very closely with the mental health team. I, I would say, you know, the question was specific to uh, mental health of individuals with disabilities. I, I think we're looking at significant uh, mental health impacts of people with and without disabilities. Um, uh during th this uh the the covid-19 process i think we're uh strongly expecting there to be um 
significant impacts on, on mental health and well-being and we need to be ready for that and we're putting some um, messages in place. I think we're looking at it from a number of different perspectives. First of all, from a, a general population point of view of practical measures for managing stress and, and, and some uh, key messages for being able to have good mental health and well-being uh, and promote good mental health and well-being in spite of potential um, social isolation circumstances, um, which includes aspects such as um, meditation, continuing exercise, also reducing um, and, and trying to limit the uh, volume of uh, news or being able to uh, take time away from uh, from just that the constant sort of 24 hour news cycle that we're seeing at the moment and being able to uh, take mental breaks from that. So some practical recommendations that have come out that are just as applicable uh, to people with as, as without disability um, as well. And then sort of trying to really ramp up the health service response. So being able to make sure that there are counselors, that there are professionals um, who are able to provide, again, adapted maybe telehealth services um, to be able to support people who are having um, episodes of um, psychological um, health and well-being issues, um, to be able to talk to a professional and discuss with a professional, and providing also frontline workers, not necessarily just health workers, but police and, and other providers, key ways in messaging around mental health to be able to deliver either individual psychological um, support and first aid, but also uh, in terms of giving um, support and, and assurance messaging um, on, on mental health and well-being. But uh, really the answer to the question is, is it impacting or expected to impact mental health? The answer is, is yes. And, and we're really at PAHO trying to do a lot as are other WHO agencies and other agencies as well. CDC, um, I think just um, a couple of days ago, put out a really great web page about mental health and well-being as well. So um, there are resources being put out um, about how what you can do and just as much as looking after your physical health um, and preventing um, virus uh, is looking after mental health and well-being during this difficult period as well. Herman, do you want to add anything to that? This is Herman. Um, thank you, Anthony. You, you were very specific on, on the procedural. Um, bringing it down to uh, people with disabilities all disabilities, including psychosocial. Um, may I ask uh, for the question, was it clear what country your, the, the, the question came from? It wasn't. I think it was a, a general question. Okay. So generally speaking, first, uh, adding just briefly to add to everything, Anthony, is informed decision, you know, this is, this is new for everyone. We can all be clear on that. And through all disabilities, uh, I mean, I, in my family, I have people that have autism and, and different developmental disabilities. And it's about having conversations alongside all this. So when you're not on the news, on this is a disaster. It's a different disaster, but having just those conversations, just not go wash your hands, um, I, we are finding to be paramount. Um, the more we talk about it in our households and, and in our communities, just adding that one quick point. And then secondly, um, for individuals, for every citizen, this is, a, this, is a, this is impacting all of us. So crisis counseling, and if the question comes from the United States, um, it is something that it, one of the main services that FEMA is to be providing. Um, but crisis counseling um, within your countries, the, the equivalent, it's the team that has the expertise best to provide this. Great, thanks, Herman. We've got a few um, uh, specific questions coming in now, so I'll, I'll read a few of those out and maybe you can answer one or two. Um, there's, um, what advice would you give to Latin American Network to increase influence at political level and, and that connects with also how are networks in Latin America coordinating with governments 
and any good practice or lessons that could be shared. And if you're man, maybe I'll I'll pass that over to you. And then there's a, a, a US specific one. Um, uh, maybe Jennifer, you feel comfortable or, or not sure, but um, it specifically relates to during the emergency situation in the US, how people with disabilities are being included in the stimulus package being voted on at this time. Um, if there is any any clarity on that. Uh, and, and thirdly, is there a repository of documents or guidelines that persons with disability uh, for persons with disabilities that can be shared? Um, I believe yes, so I think the International Disability Alliance um, are compiling a repository of documents, and I can share that link um, after the webinar for you as well. Uh, Herman, would you like to answer a little bit about um, to the network to increase influence at political level and also coordinating with governments? Thank you, Anthony. Um, in the you you will be including Riares link in the PowerPoint share or the document share. Yes, yes, can do. So please look at Riares um, information and and we are part of it along with ONG Inclusiva ONG Inclusiva with Carlos Kaiser. You can contact me at dart d a r t at disasterstrategies.org. And my information is also uh, on the PowerPoint. Um, in our website, disasterstrategies.org, um, there's a link to COVID, and we have our national call to action for the United States. And it can be applicable to, we can help you make it applicable to your country in South America. And we have Spanish versions. We are ramping up, and it will come out in our new website. But again, contact Riaris, contact us. Because again, based on your country, it is case by case. And the I will finally finalize with the thematic group of persons with disabilities within the disaster DR network um put out a call to action to Secretary General to make a point to government to all the points that we've covered and include people with disabilities. So contact us. We'll share that with you and will help you in your countries push the need to include people with disabilities. I think the next question was addressed to Jennifer. Great, thanks, oh, man. That was uh, uh, really useful. Jennifer, um, the, the question about specific to the US about the, the stimulus package, I don't know whether you're um, able to comment on that, but um, uh, just uh, addressing to you. Sure. Um, there have been a couple of um, relief packages, as we call them, um, that have been passed by Congress. Um, the second one uh, is, or third one, I think it is actually, um, has, they're just working on the final details for it to go through passage. Uh, in this most recent one, there was funding included $15 million for centers for independent living, which are programs that we fund out of the administration on disabilities. Uh, so we are um, rapidly looking at that and uh, trying to get that funding out to our centers for independent living as a resource uh, for the disability community and the COVID response. Um, I know that in some of these relief packages, there have been um, uh, elements of it that have been targeted at uh, families uh, who may need to take time to support their loved ones who, um, uh, when they have to stay at home um, and might have disruption in their access to care. So uh, there are some provisions um, that will address the needs of families uh, in some of these relief packages. Um, I don't know of anything else specific to people with disabilities, though, in terms of funding um, for services, uh, but those are things that we continue to monitor, and we anticipate that um, in the coming weeks, Congress will be considering additional relief packages, uh, so there are opportunities in the, in the future to make sure that if there are needs, um, that they could be considered by Congress. Great, thanks, Jennifer. And I think there was also a specific question for you. I mentioned about the IDA uh, compiling some documents, but in the US, are you compiling any documents around uh, disability and COVID, or is there a place where people can go for things that are being developed in the US? 
Um, I, I should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, we do have a number of resources that we're compiling um, and developing. Uh, and so if you go to our uh, website, uh, acl.gov backslash COVID-19, there are resources that we are providing there for the aging and disability population. Um, so I encourage you to visit that. Uh, we, the CDC is also a good source of information and they are putting together some resources specifically for the disability population. Um, and then uh, you mentioned IDE. I don't know if you meant that in reference to the special education law in um, the US. But I know the Department of Education has been posting some materials uh, related to special education services under COVID-19, um, where children have been impacted if, if their schools are, have closed. Um, so those are just some of the resources that we do have available. Great, thanks. Uh, at IDA I was more referencing the International yeah. Disability Alliance, but it's useful also to know the yeah. education side. I think <laughs> a lot of people are getting questions about um, uh, education, uh, educational needs of children with disability and, and supporting that. So it's great to know that some resources are being put up there as well, because that's certainly been a, a question. As I read through, and we, we're close to the closing time, and I want to hand over to Anna Lucia Arellano from the International Disability Alliance to close us up. There was just one or two more questions, and we'll do this as a final round um, before I hand over to her. Another one about psychosocial disability and telehealth, and whether there is examples to share of distance online services. I would say that's something at PAHO that we're working on um, collecting now um, and working on clear guidelines for providing psychosocial support uh, and telehealth. The same, uh, we're also doing that for rehabilitation services and looking at delivery of rehabilitation services, um, uh, utilizing tele-rehabilitation. So watch this space for both of those components. Um, uh, but as I said, one of the pieces that the mental health team at PAHO is working on is delivery of, um, uh, of specific uh, psychosocial support and counseling. Um, uh, I, I don't know, again, Jennifer, if there's any, anything that you wanted to add to that. Um, I know that uh, there, um, in some of the packages that have moved forward, they've given more flexibilities for the use of telehealth. Um, and telemedicine to deliver care and mental health um, supports. So uh, we do have, um, you know, that ability here in the U.S. to utilize that. And we do have um, several states that do utilize and providers that utilize that as a method for getting services out. Um, the other thing that I might mention in terms of the use of technology, we do have some emerging work here in the U.S. around the use of technology just for, um, to support people living in their home um, and the use of remote technologies as a way to support their independent living so that they don't need to have somebody come into the house. Uh, and so that is, again, something that is emerging technology here that is being used to support people living in their home. Um, we haven't necessarily looked into that uh, as part of the COVID-19 response, but certainly is something to consider. Great, thanks, Jennifer. And then a last question for you, from Amanda, might speak to a little bit the, the role that civil society and disabled people's organizations can play, is how would you advise public and private sector employers to ensure that work from home approach is in the best interests of people with disabilities, given it might impact on physical and well-being? Um, I don't know whether you had any thoughts on engagement with uh, em employment uh, groups, private and public sector. This is Herman. I mean, again, allowing and it is in in when people go into our national call to action in detail, giving people with disabilities as in the United States, the CDC has uh, listed a number of disabilities, including neuro neurological um, disabilities, to that we we we're more susceptible to the symptoms. Um, critical or severe uh, to work from home to allow that to pre create the, the the possibilities for that if needed for the government it's not in this one but maybe Jennifer you can help for the next one to have some incentives for employers to create uh, uh, allow persons with disabilities um, and older adults to work from home but also um, as has been said 
having BPO, civic society, involved in these conversations at the local level um, will create the changes that we need. Thank you, Herman. Uh, uh, Jennifer, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, not specific uh, to the, I guess, the, the comment about the work environment. I think there was something about the use of teleworking. Is that correct? Yeah, um, just just ways of engaging with employers um, to uh, ensure that um, working from home approaches is, is in people with disabilities interest. Yeah, we haven't um, been working as much on that front, um, but in general, yes, I mean, we do outreach to employers and we have a work that we do in employment. Um, but again, in the response effort, we haven't really been focusing on the work aspect of accommodations that might be provided. Uh, the, but in terms of um, engagement um, with uh, organizations, you know, certainly in the U.S., that is the way many things get done is through uh, local grassroots advocacy, as we call it. Um, and what's particularly important to us um, here in the U.S. and in the, with the disability community, and I think I mean re re referred to this, is uh, to work with groups of individuals with lived experiences. Um, they certainly uh, bring the best voice to the conversation to talk about their lived experiences and how uh, things like COVID and, and other things will impact their life and what it is that they need uh, in order to live uh, an independent life. Um, so certainly we value that input and uh, support those efforts and um, find that to be vital to uh, progress in the U.S. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, Unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for questions. I know that there was a few more. Um, uh, it's been a, a, a great opportunity to hear from you. I would like to continue to hear um, feedback that maybe you have, ways in which PAHO um, and other groups can, can work together in this period um, over the coming weeks and months um, to ensure that um, inclusion of people with disabilities is um, a, a fully integrated part of the COVID response. So look forward to hearing comments on the documents, other suggestions that you might have for other uh, webinars or the other ways in which we can continue this dialogue and, and make sure that this uh, issue continues to get uh, uh, included. I'm going to hand over now to Ana Lucia Arrellano, uh, who is the president of the International Disability Alliance, to get, so give some closing remarks. Thank you, Ana Lucia. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, good afternoon uh, from Quito, Ecuador. I am Ana Lucia Arellano. I am the mother of a 23-year-old Down syndrome youth and also a mother of, of, a, of a doctor. So you can imagine where, I'm, where I am facing now in Ecuador with this lockdown and trying to support the disability movement from the global south and especially paying attention to what is happening in Latin America, as I am also the president for VIARES, the Latin American network of organizations of persons with disabilities and their families. So what I would, uh, at the end of this session, I would like to uh, insist is all the efforts that the global and regional uh, disability movement is trying to bring is all updated information in uh, IDA's webpage, you can Google at internationaldisabilityalliance.org and you can find um, all the updates on how COVID-19 is affecting persons with disabilities in different countries and especially what we have uh, worked upon um, some key recommendations uh, towards the disability inclusive response in front of COVID-19, and we are also doing our best trying to translate all this information into Spanish, um, not yet available in sign language interpretation, but um, we are also trying uh, to uh, launch also uh, soon a statement uh, from the global disability movement, especially upon um, um, making this call to uh, the states 
for the attention and immediate action in order to prohibit any current and future guidance or practice which would lead to the denial or restriction of access to COVID-19 treatment, in particular life-saving treatment and care on the basis of disability. So we have been uh, receiving uh, lots of alarming reports from people with disabilities and their representative organizations uh, about practices of and official guidelines recommending medical triage criteria resulting in deliberately excluding or deprioritizing persons with disabilities from the access to COVID-19 treatment or even depriving them of life-saving resources such as ventilators. So uh, yes, we are really, really concerned and we would like to put this red uh, light, a very high alert of, of what is really going on around the, the situations of persons with disabilities worldwide. And um, because we're also worried that such guidance or practices are undermining the very essence of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, equal dignity and value for all human beings, regardless of any kind of distinction, including on basis of disability. But we really want to, to bring an advocacy in a very practical way. And uh, we want to make CRPD and SDGs uh, very practical within the disability movement. And even with what we are experiencing in the global south, I must say that persons with disabilities are really being left behind. And um, especially in some countries in, in Latin America, persons with disabilities for, uh, from those countries that are uh, being uh, or are experiencing lockdowns and there are uh, prohibiting um, also uh, mobilizations of population in general. Um, our, our, our disability movement also supporting the lack of even food, not, all, not also medicines, you know. In Latin America also, we are facing poverty. So not all persons with disabilities are able to to purchase masks that are masks that are of course are are, are lacking, or uh, purchasing um, antibacterial gel or alcohol. So persons of, with disabilities sometimes they are even uh, going out and trying to get some money because they depend on this day, uh, for a daily basis on the work that they uh, usually. Uh, 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 practice uh, so life is for persons with disabilities in real danger now, uh, especially as I said in this part of of the world, where where the government has not the possibility to uh, support um, families even in rural areas, because you know we don't have data, and now as we do not really know exactly where persons with disabilities are located, even in countries where persons with disabilities were not even identified. So we have, are receiving reports that persons with disabilities, uh, because they are also lacking of food, and there are some support networks of volunteers that are trying to, to bring uh, some provisions that our efforts are at this time are really weak. So we want to make this call upon all all our networks and all our stakeholders or our allies that we will really be able to work together and to support all those networks that are already connected with especially WHO to make all our big efforts to really not leave any persons with disabilities behind. And we are more than available, as I said, all this information that we are trying to uh, translate and to um, update on our web page. We are also uh, more than available to keep sharing all the information that uh, all other networks are sharing with us. So please, uh, let's do this a very unique time that we can really support persons with disabilities. Remember that, well, that the time that we have to make information accessible to a person with disabilities, that all, not all governments are using accessible formats. So even though our disability movement is trying also to advocate for this, uh, not all these measures are yet put in place. 
So yes, we are here more than ready to keep supporting uh, all these efforts that WHO is doing. So thanks a lot, Anthony, for also uh, giving us this opportunity to raise the high importance to really be able to work together. Thank you very much for those words, Anna Lucia, and, and thank you for everyone joining this afternoon. Um, a transcript uh, and a recording of this, as well as all of the links, will go onto the PAHO website. Um, there is also, for information uh, about INGRID uh, inclusion, disability inclusion in hospitals, um, the link is here, and we'll leave this on for a few minutes at the end. Um, for anyone working in hospital delivery as well. And thank you very much for your time and attention this afternoon. Thank you. Bye. -bye.